Robert Allen Durst, born April 12, 1943, is an American real estate heir and suspected serial killer, the son of New York City businessman Seymour Durst and the elder brother of Douglas Durst, head of the Durst organization. He is suspected of having murdered three people, Kathleen McCormack Durst, his first wife, who disappeared in New York in 1982, Susan Berman, his longtime friend, who was killed in Los Angeles in 2000, and his neighbor, Morris Black, who was killed in Texas in 2001. Durst was the subject of a multi-state manhunt after Black's body parts were found floating in Galveston Bay. Although he admitted dismembering Black, he was acquitted of murdering Black on the grounds of self-defense. On March 14, 2015, Durst was arrested in New Orleans on a first-degree murder warrant in relation to the Berman killing. In 2016 he was transferred to California, and in 2018 a judge ruled there was sufficient evidence for him to be tried for the death of Berman. Durst's trial began March 2, 2020, but was postponed after six days due to the COVID-19 pandemic. After additional delays, the trial resumed May 17, 2021. Also on May 17, 2021, the Westchester County District Attorney said that the disappearance of Kathleen McCormack Durst had been reclassified as a murder and would be reinvestigated. Early Life The eldest of four children, Robert Durst was born on April 12, 1943, and grew up in Scarsdale, New York. He is the son of real estate investor Seymour Durst and his wife Bernice Herstein. His siblings are Douglas, Tommy, and Wendy. Durst's paternal grandfather, Joseph Durst, who was a tailor when he emigrated from Austria-Hungary in 1902, eventually became a successful real estate manager and developer, founding the Durst organization in 1927. Seymour became head of the family business in 1974 upon his father's death. When Robert was seven, his mother died as a result of a fall from the family's Scarsdale home. He later claimed that, moments before her death, his father walked him to a window from which he could see her standing on the roof. In a March 2015 New York Times interview, however, his brother Douglas denied that Robert had witnessed her death. As children, Robert and Douglas underwent counseling for sibling rivalry. A 1953 psychiatrist report on 10-year-old Robert mentioned personality decomposition and possibly even schizophrenia. Durst attended Scarsdale High School, where classmates described him as a loner. He earned a bachelor's degree in economics in 1965 from Lehigh University, where he was a member of the varsity lacrosse team and the business manager of the Brown and Dwight student newspaper. Durst enrolled in a doctoral program at the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA, later that year, where he met Susan Berman, but eventually withdrew from the school and returned to New York in 1969. Durst eventually became a real estate developer in the Durst organization. However, his brother Douglas was appointed, in 1992, to run the family business. The appointment caused a rift between Robert and his family, which eventually led to him suing for his share of the family fortune. Capital crimes for which Durst has been investigated police have directly questioned Durst, and sometimes conducted searches, in connection to the disappearance of his first wife, Kathy McCormack, and the homicides of Berman and Morris Black. He was tried and acquitted of murder in the Black case. Disappearance of Kathleen McCormack Durst in the fall of 1971, Durst met Kathleen Kathy McCormack, a medical student. After two dates, he invited McCormack to share his home in Vermont, where he had opened a health food store. She moved there in January 1972. However, Durst's father pressured him to move back to New York to work in the family business. The couple returned to Manhattan, where they married on April 12. 1973, Durst's 30th birthday. McCormack was a student in her fourth and final year at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in the Bronx studying to be a pediatrician when she disappeared. She was only a few months short of earning her degree.
McCormack was last seen by someone other than Nurse the evening of January 31, 1982, when she appeared unexpectedly at a dinner party thrown by her friend Gilbert Najami in Newtown, Connecticut. Najami noticed that McCormack was upset and was wearing red sweatpants, which Najami found odd. McCormack had often dressed in much higher quality clothing. McCormack later left for her marital home in South Salem, New York, after a phone call from her husband. Although the couple argued and fought that evening, Durst maintained that he put his wife on a commuter train to New York City at Katona Station, had a drink with a neighbor, and spoke to his wife at their Manhattan apartment by telephone later that evening. That's what I told police, Durst later told documentary filmmakers. I was hoping that would just make everything go away. After McCormack had left Najama's house, she was supposed to meet Najami at a pub called the Lions Gate in Manhattan. When she failed to show up, Najami became concerned and repeatedly called the police for several days. Days later, Durst filed a missing person report as well. A doorman and the building superintendent at the couple's apartment on Riverside Drive claimed to have seen McCormack there on February 1st, the day after she was last indisputably seen, but the doorman also said that he had seen her only from behind and from half a block away, and couldn't be certain that it was her. A private investigator, hired by Durst's own criminal lawyer, later reported that the doorman said he had not seen McCormack arrive at all and may not have been working the night she disappeared. McCormack had been treated at a Bronx hospital for facial bruises three weeks before her disappearance. She told a friend that Durst beat her but did not press charges over the incident. McCormack asked Durst for a $250,000 divorce settlement. Instead, Durst cancelled his wife's credit card, removed her name from a joint bank account, and refused to pay her medical school tuition. At the time McCormack disappeared, Durst had been dating Prudence Farrow for three years and was living in a separate apartment. Durst initially offered $100,000 for his wife's return, then reduced the reward to $15,000. Only three weeks after Durst reported McCormack missing, the superintendent at the Riverside Drive apartment found her possessions in the building's trash compactor. When one of McCormack's friends and her sister found out that she had been reported missing, they broke into her cottage hoping to find her. Instead, they found the cottage ransacked, McCormack's mail left unopened, and her belongings in the trash. Investigation and aftermath after McCormack went missing, police said that Durst had claimed to have last spoken to her when she called him at the Riverside Drive apartment. He claimed that the last time he had seen her was at Gatona Station, where she was planning to board a 9.15 p.m. train to Manhattan. He also claimed that on February 4th, the supervisor at McCormack's medical school called him and said that she had called in sick on February 1st and was absent from class for the entire week. It is uncertain if it was indeed McCormack who made the call. The day after Durst received the call from McCormack's medical school, he reported her as missing. The police found his stories to be full of contradictions. Eight years after McCormack's disappearance, Durst divorced her, claiming spousal abandonment. In 2016, the McCormack family asked to have Kathleen declared legally dead, a request that was granted the following year. Kathleen's mother, Anne McCormack, attempted to sue Durst for $100 million, alleging that he killed McCormack and deprived them of the right to bury her. McCormack's parents are now deceased. Her younger sister, Mary McCormack Hughes, also believes that Durst murdered her. The New York State Police quietly reopened the criminal investigation into the disappearance in 1999, searching Durst's former South Salem residence for the first time. The investigation became public in November 2000.In August 2019, a wrongful death lawsuit filed by McCormack's sister Carol Bomonti against Durst, which accused him of murdering his wife, was dismissed on the grounds that she had waited too long to file the suit. The death date for McCormack has been changed to be most likely at the time she disappeared in 1982, due to murder, 
instead of the previous determination of 1987 for a missing person. Homicide of Susan Berman Susan Berman, a longtime friend of Lewis who had facilitated his public alibi after McCormack's disappearance, was the daughter of David Berman, a reputed gangster who in the late 1940s operated the Flamingo Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas, Nevada. On December 24, 2000, Berman was found murdered execution style in her home in Benedict Canyon, Los Angeles, California, after her neighbors called the police to report that her back door was open and her three fox terriers were loose. A few days later, the Beverly Hills Police Department received a handwritten note postmarked December 23rd, which contained Berman's address and the word, cadaver. Durst is known to have been in Northern California days before Berman was killed and to have flown from San Francisco to New York the night before Berman's body was discovered. Berman had recently received $50,000 from Durst in two payments. Although Durst confirmed to the Los Angeles Police Department, LAPD, that he had sent Berman $25,000, and faxed investigators a copy of her 1982 deposition regarding his missing wife, he declined to be further questioned about the murder. Durst said in a 2005 deposition that Berman called him shortly before her death to say that the LAPD wanted to talk to her about McCormack's disappearance. A study of case notes by The Guardian cast doubts on whether the LAPD had made such a call, or whether then Westchester County District Attorney Janine Pirro had scheduled an interview with Berman at all. Durst went into hiding and moved to Galveston, Texas, in 2000, disguising himself as a woman to avoid police inquiries. He had been tipped off to the reopened McCormack investigation on October 31, 2000, and immediately began planning for life as a fugitive. Berman biographer Kathy Scott has asserted that Durst killed Berman because she knew too much about his wife's disappearance. Killing and dismemberment of Morris Black on October 9, 2001, Durst was arrested in Galveston shortly after body parts belonging to his elderly neighbor, Morris Black, were found floating in Galveston Bay. He was released on $300,000 bail the next day. Durst missed a court hearing on October 16th and a warrant was issued for his arrest on a charge of bail jumping. On November 30th, he was caught inside a Wegmans supermarket in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, after trying to shoplift band-aids, a newspaper, and a chicken salad sandwich, even though he had $500 cash in his pocket. A police search of his rental car yielded $37,000 in cash, two guns, marijuana, Black's driver's license, and directions to Gilbert Najama's home in Connecticut. Durst also used his time on the run to stalk his brother Douglas, visiting the driveway of his home in Katona, New York, while armed. Durst employed defense attorney John Waldron while he was held on charges in Pennsylvania. He was eventually extradited to Texas for trial. Trial in 2003, Durst was tried for the murder of Black. He employed defense attorney Dick DeGarren and claimed self-defense. DeGarren conducted two mock trials in preparation for the case. Durst's defense team had difficulty communicating with him, so they hired psychiatrist Dr. Milton Altshuler to find out why. Altshuler spent over 70 hours examining Durst and diagnosed him with Asperger syndrome, saying, his whole life's history is so compatible with a diagnosis of Asperger's disorder. His defense team argued at trial that the diagnosis explained his behavior. Durst claimed he in black, a cranky and confrontational loner struggled for control of Durst's .22 caliber target pistol after Black grabbed it from its hiding place and threatened him with it. During the struggle, the pistol discharged, shooting Black in the face. During cross-examination, Durst admitted to using a paring knife, two saws, and an axe to dismember Black's body before bagging and dumping his remains in Galveston Bay. Black's head was never recovered so prosecutors were unable to present sufficient forensic evidence to dispute Durst's account of the struggle. As a result of lack of forensics, the jury acquitted Durst of murder on November 11, 2003. On December 21, 2004, 
Anders pleaded guilty to two counts of bail jumping and one count of evidence tampering for his dismemberment of Black's body. As part of a plea bargain, he received a sentence of five years and was given credit for time served, requiring him to serve three years in prison. Durst was paroled on July 15, 2005. The rules of his release required him to stay near his home, permission was required to travel. That December, Durst made an unauthorized trip to the boarding house where Black had been killed and to a nearby shopping mall. At the mall, he ran into former Galveston trial judge Susan Chris, who had presided over his trial. Due to this incident, the Texas Board of Pardons and Paroles determined that Durst had violated the terms of his parole and returned him to jail. He was released again from custody on March 1, 2006. Asked in March 2015 whether she believed Durst murdered Black. Chris commented, you could see that this person knew what they were doing and that it was not a first time. The body was cut perfectly like a surgeon who knew how to use this tool on this bone and a certain kind of tool on that muscle. It looked like not a first time job. That was pretty scary. The Jinx TV documentary in early 2015, a six-part HBO documentary titled The Jinx, The Life and Deaths of Robert Durst described circumstantial evidence linking Durst to the murder of Berman, who was believed to have knowledge of McCormack's disappearance. The documentary detailed the disappearance of McCormack, Berman's subsequent death, and the killing of Black. Against the advice of his lawyers and his wife Deborah Lee Charaton, Durst gave multiple interviews and unrestricted access to his personal records to the filmmakers. The FBI arrested Durst in New Orleans on the same day as the final episode was broadcast. The documentary ended with him moving into a bathroom where his microphone recorded him seemingly saying to himself, There it is. You're caught. You're right, of course. But you can't imagine. Arrest him, I don't know what's in the house, oh. I want this, what a disaster, he was right. I was wrong. And the burping, I'm having difficulty with the question, what the hell did I do? Kill them all, of course. It was later learned in 2019 the filmmakers altered the sequence of Durst's comments, which reduced the apparent severity of his musings in the bathroom. The Associated Press reported that a March 1999 letter from Durst to Berman, discovered by her stepson and turned over to the filmmakers during their research, provided key new evidence leading to the filing of murder charges. Berman Trial Arrest a few days after a first-degree murder warrant was signed by a Los Angeles judge in relation to the Berman killing, Durst was arrested by FBI agents on March 14, 2015, at the Canal Street Marriott in New Orleans, where he had registered under the false name, Everett Ward. Durst, who had been tracked to the hotel after making two calls to check his voicemail, was observed wandering aimlessly in the lobby and mumbling to himself, having driven to New Orleans from Houston four days before. In addition to a .38 revolver loaded with four live rounds and one spent shell casing, police recovered five ounces of marijuana, Durst's birth certificate and passport, Maps of Louisiana, Florida, and Cuba, a flesh-toned latex mask, the fake Texas ID used to check into the hotel, a new cell phone, and cash totaling $42,631. Police discovered a UPS tracking number, which led to an additional $117,000 cash and a pair of shoes and a package sent to Durst by a friend in New York, which was seized after his arrest. Bank statements found in one of Durst's Houston condominiums reveal cash withdrawals of $315,000 in little more than a month. On oh, March 15, 2015, New York State Police investigator Joseph Becerra, long involved with the McCormack case and said to have been working closely with the FBI and Los Angeles detectives, removed some 60 file boxes of Durst's personal papers and effects from the home of Durst's friend Susan T. Giordano in Campbell Hall, New York. All of these items had been sent to Giordano for safekeeping three years prior by Deborah Lee Charaton, Durst's wife at the time. 
Also stored at Giordano's residence were videotaped depositions of Durst, Durst's brother, Douglas, and Char Aiton, all of which were related to the black case. Los Angeles County Deputy District Attorney John Lewin, in charge of prosecuting Durst, claimed to have found information uncovered by the filmmakers in the HBO documentary series The Jinx to be compelling and repeatedly flew to New York to interview witnesses, including friends of Durst and Berman. Firearm charge on March 16, 2015. Defense attorney Richard Tagaran advised court authorities in New Orleans that his client waived extradition and would voluntarily return to California. Late that same day, Louisiana State Police filed charges against Durst for being a felon in possession of a firearm and for possession of a firearm with a controlled substance, forestalling his immediate return to California. Orland Parish District Attorney Leon Canizzaro commented that, in light of prior convictions that could influence Durst's sentencing, J. Oost for those gun charges here in Louisiana, Durst could face up to life in prison. Oh, on March 23, Durst was denied bail by a Louisiana judge after prosecutors argued he was a flight risk. In an effort to hasten his extradition to California and avoid a protracted Louisiana court battle, Tagaran raised questions about the validity of the New Orleans arrest and hotel room search, pointing out that a local judge did not issue a warrant until hours after his client was detained. While communicating with the LAPD and conducting an inventory of Bruce's hotel room possessions, T. He FBI held him there, incommunicado, for almost eight hours. According to Tagaran, Durst was questioned extensively by a Los Angeles prosecutor and detective without a lawyer present, on the morning after his arrest. In failing to produce the arresting officers subpoenaed for a probable cause hearing, Durst's attorneys charged that Louisiana prosecutors engaged in a misguided attempt to conceal the facts from the court, the defendant, and the public. Peter Mansfield, an assistant U.S. attorney, said that his office instructed the two FBI agents and arresting officer not to appear arguing that Tagaran's subpoenas were issued in an attempt to conduct actions against them in their official capacities for the purpose of obtaining testimony, information and material maintained under color of their official duties. On April 8, a day after the U.S. attorney filed an independent federal weapons charge, Durst was formally indicted by a Louisiana grand jury for carrying a weapon with a controlled substance and for the illegal possession of a firearm by a felon. Later that month, Durst's lawyers requested that more than $161,000 seized by authorities during their searches be returned, saying the cash is not needed as evidence, is not contraband, and is not subject to forfeiture. After negotiations with Durst's defense team, Louisiana authorities ultimately dropped weapons charges against Durst on April 23. 2015. Durst's trial on the federal weapons charge was scheduled for September 21, 2015. Tagaran confirmed rumors that Durst was in poor health, stating that he suffers from hydrocephalus and had a stent put into his skull two years before, as well as spinal surgery and a cancerous mass removed from his esophagus. Durst's attorneys requested a later date for the federal weapons charge trial, saying they'd need more time to prepare after rulings on pending motions. U.S. District Judge Helen Berrigan later rescheduled the trial to January 11, 2016. On November 16, 2015, a New Orleans federal judge ordered Durst rearranged on the weapons charges and scheduled a hearing for December 17. When asked, Durst's attorney said only that Durst did not kill Berman and that he wants to resolve the other charges to expedite Durst's extradition to Los Angeles to face that charge. Oh, and December 16, 2015, prosecutors and defense attorneys told Berrigan in a joint motion that scheduling conflicts ruled out all dates before a January 11th trial date. Berrigan ultimately rescheduled the trial for February 3, 2016, and Durst changed his plea to guilty to the federal gun charge and received an 85-month prison sentence. Incarceration Durst, BOP number 45101079, was originally placed in USP Terre Haute, but was later transferred to a Los Angeles County jail awaiting trial. 
trial. The trial was scheduled to begin in Los Angeles after Durst was arraigned in California, but his transfer was delayed by the U.S. Bureau of Prisons due to serious surgery, according to Tagarin. A conditional hearing was convened in February 2017, where Nick Javin, a close friend of Durst's and at whose wedding Durst served as best man, testified that Durst had confessed to him of having murdered Berman. Javin will be one of the prosecution's witnesses against Durst. A preliminary hearing was initially scheduled for October 2017, but was postponed to April 2018 to accommodate Durst's defense team, some of whom suffered damage to their homes and offices from Hurricane Harvey. The pre-trial hearings included extensive testimony from a number of older witnesses who potentially would not be available when the trial itself begins. In October 2018, Los Angeles County Superior Judge Mark Wyndham ruled there was enough evidence to try Durst for the murder of Berman, and Durst would be arraigned November 8, 2018. During his court appearance the following day, Durst pleaded not guilty. In January 2019, Wyndham set Durst's trial date as September 3, 2019. At the same time, the judge ruled that prosecutors can present evidence involving the black murder. Prosecutors will try to connect Berman's death with McCormack's disappearance, which they want to show as the foundation for the motive for Berman's slaying. In his ruling that prosecutors could use evidence from the Texas case, Judge Wyndham said the killings of Black and Berman seemed to be intertwined. The murder charge against Durst includes the special circumstance allegations of lying in wait and killing a witness to a crime. There is also an allegation that he used a handgun to carry out the murder. In May 2019, a motion filed by Durst's attorneys claimed two handwriting samples, the anonymous cadaver note from 2000 informing Beverly Hills Police that a body could be found at her house and a letter in 1999 from Durst to Berman, along with other evidence from his 2015 arrest at his hotel in New Orleans, were illegally obtained. Durst's lawyers also claimed there was a Fourth Amendment violation that would exclude the New Orleans evidence and that the search of his hotel room was unlawful. On May 8, 2019, Los Angeles County prosecutors filed an affidavit replying to the motion. Prosecutor John Lewin said Durst is creating an elaborate conspiracy theory between the producers of the HBO documentary miniseries The Jinx, law enforcement officers, and the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office to make the defendant incriminate himself and to time his arrest to maximize media attention and ratings. However, defendant completely fails to acknowledge the most relevant fact leading to his arrest and the subsequent search of his hotel room and damning interview. Law enforcement was on notice that defendant was actively preparing to flee the country right after crucial evidence connecting him to Susan's Berman murder was widely publicized on national television. When viewed in this context, it is readily apparent that the actions taken by law enforcement were more than reasonable. They were absolutely necessary to prevent a murderer, who had already avoided apprehension for more than 30 years, from fleeing the country and evading justice. On May 17, 2019, L.A. County Judge Mark Wyndham granted Durst's defense team a four-month postponement of his murder trial. The delay was granted after defense lawyers raised concerns about the volume of evidence in the case and conflicts with attorney schedules. On September 3, 2019, L.A. County Judge Mark Wyndham rejected an attempt by defense attorneys for Durst to strip the producers of the jinx of protection under California's Journalist Shield law by having them declared government agents. A number of other procedural rulings also went against Durst. L.A. County Prosecuting Attorney John Lewin set another hearing on discovery and other matters for October 28. Additional evidential hearings were held in December 2019 regarding the admissibility of statements Durst made in March 2015 just after his arrest in New Orleans. At an interview with Lewin.in, a surprise move on December 24, 2019, Durst lawyers contradicted his previous statements and filed court documents admitting that Durst wrote the cadaver note. In all previous statements about the note, 
Anders consistently denied writing the note, although the handwriting appears to be similar to his own as is the misspelling of the word Beverly contained in a prior letter to Berman that Durst admitted to authoring. During the filming of the jinx, Durst told the filmmakers that the person who wrote the cadaver note was taking a big risk because it was something that only the killer could have written. He told his godson, Howard Altman, the person who wrote the note killed her. However, in August 2019, Durst's attorneys also argued that what the note demonstrates is that the person who mailed it was aware that there was a body at the house, not that the individual murdered Susan Berman. On March 2, 2020, Durst appeared in court to begin his trial for the murder of Susan Berman, which was expected to take several months. However, the proceedings were postponed amid the COVID-19 pandemic. In June 2020, a motion by the defense for a mistrial because of the delay was denied. In July 2020, L.A. County Judge Mark Windham ruled that a further delay until April 2021 was necessary due to the COVID-19 pandemic, but he would allow the trial to proceed if Durst agreed to a bench trial without jury. Durst declined this option and the trial was scheduled to resume on April 12, 2021. It was then postponed until May 17, 2021. On May 13, 2021, Durst's lawyers filed a motion with the court saying he has bladder cancer and moved the court to postpone the trial indefinitely and to release him on bail to receive medical treatment that is currently not being provided. The motion was denied by the court and trial resumed on May 17, 2021, with the judge questioning jurors about whether they could still remain neutral in the case after a 14-month break. One of the jurors was dismissed for ignoring court instructions to not follow the trial in the news during the pandemic break. While discussing opening statement content, Lee Durst Defense Counsel Dick Tagoran and L.A. County Deputy District Attorney John Lewin were separated by Defense Attorney David Chesnoff after yelling at each other and pointing fingers in each other's faces, and were admonished by Judge Wyndham to sit down and stop arguing. On June 10, 2021, Durst was hospitalized after being found down and not in his wheelchair. Judge Wyndham sent the jury home with plans to resume on Monday, June 14. D.A. Lewin said he has suspicions that the defendant was faking the medical crisis to force a mistrial because Durst is on record in his calls from county jail saying he intended to feign dementia or seek a mistrial due to COVID-19. I have no idea whether this is legitimate or not, but obviously, given his history, it's certainly suspect as to what his actual condition is, Lewin said noting that Durst's lawyers had twice sought mistrials during the previous day's testimony. The prosecutor added, It's very clear the defense and the defendant want this trial to go away. Other cases days after the Berman murder, police were reportedly examining connections between Durst and the disappearances of 18-year-old Lynn Schulze from Middlebury, Vermont and 16-year-old Karen Mitchell from Eureka, California. Investigators are also looking into a possible connection between Durst and the disappearance of 18-year-old Kristen Modafferi, who was last seen in San Francisco in 1997.Schulze, a Middlebury College freshman, visited Durst's health food store on December 10, 1971, the day she disappeared and was last seen that afternoon near a bus stop across from the store. Tagoran characterized the Schulze investigation as opportunistic and said he would not permit his client to be questioned by Vermont police. Author and investigative journalist Matt Birkbeck reported in 2003, and again in his 2015 book A Deadly Secret, that credit card records placed Durst in Eureka on November 25, 1997, the day Mitchell vanished. Mitchell may have volunteered in a homeless shelter that Durst frequented. Durst, dressed in women's clothing, had visited the Eureka shoe store owned by Mitchell's aunt, 
Mitchell was last seen walking to work from her aunt's store and possibly speaking to someone in a stopped car. A witness sketch of Mitchell's presumed abductor resembles Durst. Although the FBI ultimately could not connect Durst to the Long Island serial murders, in which some victims were disposed of in a similar manner to the black killing, the Bureau created an informal task force in 2012 to work with investigative agencies in jurisdictions where Durst was known to have lived in past decades, including Vermont, New York, and California. In the wake of his recent arrest, the FBI encouraged such localities to re-examine cold cases. Texas private investigator Bobby Baca has also traced Durst operating under stolen identities in Texas, Florida, Massachusetts, New Jersey, South Carolina, Mississippi, and Virginia. Personal life on December 11, 2000, shortly before the Berman killing, Durst married Deborah Lee Charayton. According to the New York Times, the couple briefly shared a Fifth Avenue apartment in 1990 but have never lived together as husband and wife. Durst once told his sister that it was a marriage of convenience. I wanted Debbie to be able to receive my inheritance, and I intended to kill myself, Durst said in a 2005 deposition. It was reported in Real Estate Weekly that Stephen I. Holm died on October 17, 2019 and Deborah Lee Charayton was his wife. After being referred to as Holmes' wife at his funeral, and in the obituary in the New York Times, Charayton sent the Times a letter saying she and Holmes were not married and asked them to print a retraction. Charayton and Holm were involved with a number of philanthropic ventures together. Durst traveled and lived under dozens of aliases over the years, using different identities to buy cars, rent apartments, and open credit card accounts. He had a scanner, copier, and a laminating machine, a former office employee of Durst told Newsweek. What I didn't realize is that I unwillingly saw what would have allowed Robert Durst to make a fake driver's license. Durst was also a prolific user of private mailboxes, and apparently conducted business under a number of canine-themed names, Woofing LLC, Woof Woof LLC, and Igor Fayette Inc. In the early 1980s, Durst owned a series of seven Alaskan Malamutes, all of which were named Igor and all of which died under mysterious circumstances, according to his brother, Douglas. In December 2014, prior to the airing of The Jinx, Douglas told the New York Times that, in retrospect, I now believe he was practicing killing and disposing of his wife with those dogs. Durst was once recorded saying he wanted to Igor Douglas. Durst, however, has disputed the assertion that he owned seven dogs named Igor. He owned three, he said, one that was run over and another that died in surgery after eating an apple core, before the Igor that lasted forever. In late 1981, while Durst was still married to McCormack, he was nearing the end of a three-year affair with Prudence Farrow, who was also married at the time. According to the New York Post, a few months before McCormack's disappearance in January 1982, Farrow called her and asked that she give Durst up, as friends said she wanted him all to herself. After Durst was acquitted of murdering Black in 2003, Farrow contacted law enforcement authorities with concerns for her safety, as she said Durst was angry with her for terminating their relationship three days before McCormack disappeared. Durst has had a number of significant medical issues since 2015, including major surgeries for esophageal cancer, having a shunt installed in his brain for hydrocephalus, and cervical spinal fusion. When arrested in New Orleans in 2015, he was found to be in possession of a variety of drugs, including a sleep aid melatonin, a muscle relaxant, and medications for high blood pressure, blood flow, and acid reflux. Financial status and residences In mid-2002, Durst signed over a power of attorney to Char Aiton and it is believed their holdings remain closely intermingled, although the current status of their relationship is unknown. In 2006, Durst gave Char Aiton around $20 million of his $65 million trust settlement. In 2011, Durst purchased a $1.75 million townhouse on Lenox Avenue in Harlem. 
a source close to his estranged family confirmed that he was living there at least some of the time, and they were keeping him under surveillance. Durst also owns three condominiums in a multi-story complex in Houston, and after filing suit, received a $200,000 settlement in 2006 from a Houston developer who refused to let him move into a unit newly purchased by his wife, which she had then immediately resold to Durst for $10. At the time of Berman's murder in Los Angeles, Durst had just sold a home in Trinidad, California, but maintained an office in Eureka while renting in nearby Big Lagoon. Media have variously reported Durst's financial status as real estate baron, rich scion, millionaire, multimillionaire, and billionaire. The Durst family's real estate holdings are worth more than $4 billion, but his brother Douglas was in control of the company beginning in 1994, shortly before their father's death. From about 1994 to 2006, Durst waged a legal campaign to gain greater control of the family trust and fortune. During that time he received $2 million a year from the trust. In 2006 the case was settled, with Durst giving up any interest in his family's properties and trusts in exchange for a one-time payment of about $65 million. It is unknown how much of that went to legal fees and taxes. Durst remained active in real estate. He reportedly sold two properties in 2014 for $21.15 million after purchasing them in 2011 for $8.65 million. At the time of his 2015 arrest, the FBI estimated Durst's net worth at approximately $100 million. The New York Times estimated his net worth at $110 million. On May 1, 2015, the New York Post reported that Douglas had settled litigation against Jinx filmmaker Andrew Jaraki, having confirmed that Robert was the source of videotaped depositions that appeared in the documentary. Robert Durst's disclosure apparently violated the terms of his 2006 agreement with the Durst family, which had dispersed to him a lump sum of family trust assets. Although it was unclear whether Jaraki confirmed Durst as his source, the New York Times reported in March 2015 that Jaraki was given unrestricted access to Durst's personal records, including the videotaped material. The settlement paves the way for Douglas to reclaim as much as $74 million of his brother's assets, effectively freezing those assets pending court judgment. This could affect Durst's ability to pay for high-caliber legal representation without tapping into real estate or other investments. The Post reported that Douglas was mulling his next move. In November 2015, nearly 34 years after her disappearance, McCormack's three sisters and 101-year-old mother Sue Durst for $100 million, citing his apparent role in her murder and his denial to her family of the right to sepulcher, a New York law that grants immediate relatives access to a deceased person's body and the opportunity to determine appropriate burial. If successful, the lawsuit could deprive Durst of most or all of his inherited fortune. McCormack's brother James had attempted in October 2015 to file a wrongful death suit against Durst on behalf of his mother, but was challenged by one of his sisters, who holds her mother's power of attorney. Tagoran said that, there is no evidence that Robert Durst had anything to do with Kathleen's disappearance. Anybody can file a lawsuit, but eventually they'll have to come with evidence. On December 7, 2015, the same family members filed a suit asking the court to freeze Durst's assets. The family's attorney, Robert Abrams, called Durst the poster child for why courts block defendants from disposing assets while civil lawsuits are pending. In July 2016, the McCormack family asked the surrogates court in Manhattan to declare that Kathy died on January 31, 1982, when she was murdered by her husband. Robert Durst so the sepulcher lawsuit could proceed. The court granted the request in 2017. Other legal issues in 2012 and 2013, Durst's family members sought and received restraining orders against him, claiming they were afraid of him. Durst was charged with trespassing in New York for walking in front of townhouses owned by his brother Douglas and other family members, 
He went on trial and was acquitted in December 2014. The judge also vacated the 13 orders of protection his family members had taken out on him. In July 2014, Durst was arrested after turning himself into police following an incident at a Houston CVS drugstore in which he allegedly exposed himself without provocation and urinated on a rack of candy. He then left the store and casually walked down the street. Durst was charged with misdemeanor criminal mischief. In December 2014, he pleaded, no contest, and was fined $500. His lawyer described the incident as an unfortunate medical mishap, as Durst had just been released from a hospital where he had undergone two medical procedures. The incident was recorded on videotape. In popular culture the events surrounding Durst inspired the 2010 film All Good Things, the title of which is a reference to a health food store of the same name set up by Durst and his wife in the 1970s. David Marks, the character based on Durst, was portrayed by Ryan Gosling. Shortly after its theatrical release, Robert Durst saw the film and contacted director Andrew Jaraki, expressing admiration for the film, which evolved into discussions between the two of them being included on the DVD video release and eventually resulting in Jiraki co-writing, co-producing, directing, and appearing in the 2015 HBO six-part documentary series about Durst titled The Jinx. Three episodes in the Law & Order television franchise gave different takes on the murders. The Law & Order episode, Hands Free. The Law & Order, Criminal Intent episode, Maledictus, and The Law & Order, Special Victims Unit episode, Devil's Dissections. Fred Armisen played Robert Durst in a 2003 sketch on Saturday Night Live and again in 2016 on Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. Kate McKinnon played Robert Durst in a 2015 SNL sketch. The American Court TV, now True TV, television series Mugshots released an episode covering Durst, titled Robert Durst, Mogul and Murder Mystery. A&E and Lifetime announced in August 2016 that they were developing a movie based on the book A Deadly Secret. The television movie, titled The Lost Wife of Robert Durst, originally aired on November 11, 2017. Investigation Discovery Network released a special miniseries titled Robert Durst, NID Murder Mystery, containing new interviews with friends and family of Durst's alleged victims, along with his defense attorney Dick DeGarren. Legal experts and crime reporters offer insights on evidence leading to Durst's arrest and scheduled 2019, now 2021, murder trial. The series originally aired on January 21 and 22, 2019. The Jury Speaks dedicated an episode to his trial in Galveston, Texas. See also List of Fugitives from Justice who are no longer sought List of people who disappeared. References Further reading Burke Beck, Matt, 2002. A Deadly Secret. The Strange Disappearance of Kathy Durst. Scott, Kathy, 2002. Murder of a Mafia Daughter. The Life and Tragic Death of Susan Berman. ISBN 1-56980-238-6. Steele, William, 2019. Sex and the Serial Killer. My Bizarre Times with Robert Durst. ISBN 978-1727241099. External links Robert Durst at IMDb Mugshots. Robert Durst at Snag Films.